Well, this has been a, um, a wonderful time together this week, this gathering together with brothers and sisters and hearing the Word of God, and, and uh, it's just been a joy. I was thinking about it, and uh, I have been coming to 3ABN for over 20 years. I remember Mitch just met me backstage and prayed with me. I remember he, when he would be, I'd show up, you know, I'd get in late from California, like one in the morning, he'd be upstairs in master control, and he was sort of the, the innkeeper also. He'd give me my key to my little room upstairs, and, and boy, things have come a long way, I'll tell you. We didn't even know what the internet was back then, but um, it's just so exciting to be back. Almost every year we do something with 3ABN, Amazing Facts and 3ABN Partner, and this fall, we're going to be doing another special program called Foundations of Faith. So I hope you'll be watching for and praying for that event. It's November 3 to 11, and it's going to be uplinked from the General Conference World Headquarters. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Right after October 31, the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, I understand some interesting things are going to be happening in Rome during that time, so I expect to have something to talk about. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I already have something to talk about. <laughs> you know, after both of the programs tonight, they were telling me that, well, we're going to gather together as they often do during the camp meeting. And they said, we're going to have, they said, Doug, make sure that you don't forget that after your sermon, we're going to have an afterglow. I said, well, my sermon tonight's on hell. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually not directly after my sermon. <laughs> Pastor Rafferty will preach and he'll, he'll make sure there's no confusion in what our afterglow is all about. <laughs> our message tonight is dealing with the subject of hell. And it is hell a place of unending torture? And this actually is one of my favorite subjects because... Uh, when I understood this, it enabled me to love God. And I will say more about that. But let me pray with you before we begin. Loving Father, we are so thankful for the truth of your word that helps us see who you are and how we can love you. And we just pray right now that your spirit will be present. I pray that my mind will be clear, my sins forgiven, and ultimately that it will be your voice that we hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, it made me shudder when I saw the news back in 2015. A Jordanian pilot was either shot down or there was a mechanical problem and he went down in Syria and he was captured by ISIS. While well, ISIS went through the charade of pretending they were going to do a prisoner exchange with this man and some prisoners that were held in Jordan. And um, it turns out they had other plans. The man thought he was going to be set free and they brought him out and they had him say some kind of confession or something on, on tape. And they put him in a metal cage and they doused him with diesel or gasoline, not exactly sure. And then ISIS, if you don't think they're wicked, they then rolled video as they set it on fire. And um, yeah, just I, I was wondering whether or not I could even share this with you. but. The reason I'm sharing it with you is anything natural within you, unless you've got some kind of sadistic problems, you would recoil at the thought of somebody, I, I not even watch the video, I couldn't bring myself to do that, I'm sure it would cause nightmares. Um, we're horrified by that. And we, we think that a people that would do that, that would put a person in a cage and burn them alive while they videotape it, it's satanic. Yes. Now with that in mind, what do you exactly think it is that most Christians say about God? What is he going to do to the lost? Is he going to burn them for 10 minutes, 5 minutes? I don't even know how long his sufferings lasted. Let's hope not long. No, they say that God, if you don't know Jesus, if you're born and you die lost, that he will then put you in this place of torture where you will feel the writhing flames of brimstone and fire and burning all over every nerve of your body in complete, undescribable agony, 
not for 10 minutes or 10 hours or 10 days, but forever and ever and call that justice. Now, I remember I used to go to a couple of Catholic schools and that's where I was taught. You're good, you go to heaven. You're bad, you go to hell. I thought, what's hell? It's a place where you burn forever and ever. And I thought, now wait a second. You're telling me everybody in the world sins. We're all born with this bent towards sin. And if we don't figure out how to do it right, that God is going to take the objects of his cre creation and for the sins of maybe 50, 60, 70 years, maybe 15 years, burn them through ceaseless ages. When I heard that, I thought, I don't think I'd ever want to serve a God like that. So our subject today is on trying to understand what is the punishment of the wicked. And actually, I'll be sharing with you the good news about hell. Matter of fact, I might even tell you the good news to start with right now. First of all, the good news is no one is burning in hell now. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you, then I'll tell you what I told you. <laughs> no one is burning in hell now. No one is going to burn there forever. Hellfire will put sinners out of their selfish misery. Hell will purify the universe. And the really good news is you don't need to go there. Uh, whenever I talk about this, I'm surprised how many people ask me a lot of questions afterward and they don't ask me near as many questions about heaven, which makes me wonder where they plan on going. <laughs> because it seems like you'd want to prepare more for your destination. <laughs> All right, first question. What two cities are given in the Bible as an example for the destruction of the wicked? It says here, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh we talked about that earlier today what that means are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire and people are wondering well there you have it Pastor Doug and I don't want to deny there are some difficult passages but I think they're easy to explain and there are a lot more passages that, that make the subject clear. And so you need to weigh the, the preponderance of evidence on this. Now, just to go back to what the story was, if you look, uh, you remember that in the Old Testament there in the book of Genesis, uh, Abraham and Lot parted ways. Lot pinched his tent towards Sodom. And the Bible says the people of Sodom were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And uh, eventually God sent two angels because they were going to judge Sodom. And um, he gave Lot an opportunity to escape. The angels, you know, after the people in the town tried to accost them and they were stricken with blindness, they said to Lot and his daughters and his wife, escape for your life. Look not behind thee. Escape to the mountains lest you be consumed. What was going to happen to those that stayed in the city? they'll be consumed. What is the fate of the wicked? The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example of those who are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Well it says the eternal fire consumed them. And then of course it says the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And the Lord looked towards Sodom and, and he, being Abraham, looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. But you know the story. His wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And so this is very important story about what judgment is for the wicked, and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah explained it. Now notice what Peter says. We read what Jude says. Look at what Peter says. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? This eternal fire burned them up forever. The reason it's called eternal fire is because the result of the fire was eternal. Have Sodom and Gomorrah ever been rebuilt? Matter of fact, a number of prophets point back to Sodom and Gomorrah and use them as an example of a city that would never be rebuilt. And he said this regarding Nineveh, he said it regarding Babylon, that they'll be like Sodom, it'll never be inhabited again, and it never was making them an example unto those who should afterward live ungodly. So if we want to know what the fate of the lost or ungodly is, the Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of that. They were consumed, 
They were burnt up with eternal fire and they perished. This is a picture of that region. I've been down to the Dead Sea in the southern part of um, the Dead Sea. It's nothing there. Matter of fact, um, I've got a friend who's made several uh, trips down to the area and he says he digs these sulfur balls out of the ground that you can take and put a match to and they'll ignite. Yeah, I've got one. I've tried it before. It works. I don't do it in church because it stinks. But um, I did it once. That's how I know. But it's real. I mean, it's the only place in the world you can find these sulfur balls embedded in the ash in the ground that you can pop out of the ground, put a match to it, and they burn. So quite literally, there is at least sulfur in brimstone in that place. Second question to consider, when will the wicked be destroyed in hellfire? 2 Peter 2.9, the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust. What do they do? They're reserved. When you call ahead to a restaurant and you say, can you reserve me a seat? That means they're holding a place for you. Are the wicked burning in hell now or are they reserved? How to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. When will they be punished? The day of judgment. To be punished. And again, Jesus said, John 12, 48, the word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. You can read John chapter 6, John chapter 11, over and over. Jesus is the judgment, the last day, the last day. So the idea that as soon as people die, they go to hell and they start to burn, is not biblical. First of all, why would you give a person the punishment and then when the Lord comes, pull them out of hell and judgment say, sure enough, you were guilty and put them back in hell again. <laughs> that wouldn't be very uh, just. Jesus tells a parable, and you know the parable of the wheat and the tares. I remember when I first read this, I thought, what is a tear? Uh, tares were, it's, it's another crop, it's actually weeds, but when they first sprout up, they look very similar to wheat. And his enemy sows the tares, and the servants say, what do we do? Do we go pull up the tares? He says, let them grow together until the harvest. Then you separate the two. And Jesus makes it pretty clear. He says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. When were they gathered and burned? It'll be the end of the world. And he says, you read on, the Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather them that do iniquity and they'll cast them into a furnace of fire where they are consumed and the Bible says they are devoured and they are burnt up. These are words that the Bible uses to describe that. You know, I remember um, years ago, I was along, must have been 30 years ago. I think I can be very honest with you now. I was listening to family radio and um, they have a Bible answer program. And it's called Open Forum. And Pastor Harold Camping, the late Pastor Harold Camping, um, was answering Bible questions. Now I'm up there, I have no telephone, all I've got is a radio, up in the hill, same place where we have our cabin now, but this was a long time ago, it was a lot more primitive, these kerosene lamps back then. And um, you used to love to listen to the, the radio. They had some great Christian music and they'd read the Bible and they really had some nice programs. But then he would come on. Now you know who Harold Camping is. He predicted the second coming two or three times. And obviously he was wrong. <laughs> and he would get on and he would answer questions. And I used to listen. It used to get me all worked up. But um, I remember one particular day, a college student called up. And she said, um, you know, I've been reading the Bible and I'd like to believe in God and I'd like to believe in Jesus, but I just don't understand how a God of love, and Jesus seems so loving, he would take the creatures that he's made and torture them if they don't love him. It's like basically saying, love me or burn in hell. And the student was thinking, you either can love me or I'm going to torture you. And that was her question. And his answer was, well, who are we to question God? And this is what the Bible says. And I thought, oh, that made me so mad. I thought, here's someone searching for the truth. And they're being fed this nonsense. Immediately after that, a lady called. And she said, and you could tell her vo voice was breaking. And she said, uh, my son was not a Christian. He had a problem drinking. He died instantly in a car accident. I just need to know, is he burning in hell now? A very direct question. He tried to evade it for a moment and finally he came right out and he said, well, according to the Bible, there's only two destinies. He's either with the Lord in heaven or he's burning now in hell. And you could hear the lady kind of choke and she hung up the phone. Oh, at this point, I'm jumping up and down. <laughs> I don't have a telephone. No cell phone back then. 
And so I jump in my car and I drive 12 miles of very bad dirt road to the nearest telephone. It was at a member's house. Her name was Dr. Lolita Simpson. And I came charging in. It was like 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. And I knew it was a one-hour program and I needed to get on the air because I thought, I, got, I hope those people are still listening because I'm going to see if I can get through and I'm going to give the answers to these things. Amen. And so I, I got to her house. I said, Dr. Simpson, got to use your phone real quick. And I had the number and I called and I got a busy signal. I'd been praying all the way down that I'd get through. And I called again and they picked up. They said, oh, please stand by and you'll be taken in line. And so I said, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Next thing I knew, I hear his voice. Welcome to Open Forum. You have your question, please. I didn't even know what I was going to say. And, and I said, yes, uh, Brother Camping. And I said, um, I'm a Christian. And then I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Because I was hoping whoever's listening would know where to go for the right answers. <laughs> and I said, and I believe the Bible clearly teaches that first of all, the dead are sleeping in their graves until the resurrection. And that no one is burning in hell now. And hell does not burn forever and ever. Can I please share a few scriptures? Thank you. You got to keep talking. And he cuts you off. <laughs> And so I started saying, it says that they burn up and they are consumed and they perish and there's no more pain. I started giving them all these verses and pretty soon uh, she had a radio and I could notice I didn't hear my voice anymore. He, he, he kind of cut in. He responded a little bit and then he let off the mute button and he let me respond again. I said, yes, I've heard those verses before and here's what this and this and this means. And I was giving him all the answers and then he cut me off. He didn't take another phone call for the last 20 minutes of the broadcast. He just kept trying to untangle the scriptures that I'd given. And I remember driving home that night. I was praying that those people were listening. And I said, Lord, boy, I would love to have a radio program where I could give people the answers. Yes. And you know, for the last 20 years, we've had Bible Answers Live. <laughs> Every week we were calling people and hopefully sharing the truth. And we meet people we meet people all the time that say, I, I've got the letters from kids. And you know, it's the, it, the ones that break your heart are the teenagers. Say, Pastor Doug, I couldn't sleep at night. I lived in terror that I was going to die lost. I'd go to church and they'd preach about hell. And I was so afraid of God. I was so afraid I'd die lost. I was in misery. And then we heard your program and we did the lesson. And I have peace for the first time in my life. Those, that just brings me such joy to know that. Now, before you take it too far, we do believe in hell, fire. And there is a punishment for the wicked and it does burn. So don't misunderstand that. Number three, if the wicked who have died are not in hell, where are they? Well, we sort of touched on this. They're in their graves. John 5, 28 and 29, the hour is coming, Jesus said, in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice and they will come forth. They that have done good will come forth are they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. It's a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of damnation. And so the dead in Christ rise first. In the second resurrection, you've got the lost and they're brought forth for their judgment. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. Yet he will be brought to the grave and remain in the tomb until that day, until the judgment day. So nobody is burning in hell now. You know, that's driven some people to absolute distraction. Christian believing parents, they've got children that die and they question their salvation and the idea that all the time they walk the earth, that they're writhing in some diabolical torture chamber. You know, how many of you have heard that, uh, you know, hell is down yonder somewhere? That's not really taught. There, there's four words that you find translated hell in the Bible. The most common is Sheol. Sheol is a Hebrew word and simply means the grave. Then you've got the word Hades. Hades comes from Greek mythology and it's a place of darkness. Pluto was the god in charge of Hades. And then you've got one time it mentions the word Tartarus and that just means again a place of darkness. And then you've got Gehenna. And there was a valley outside of Jerusalem called the Valley of Hinnom and it was the city dump and it was often smoldering and full of worms and dead things and, and uh, you'll see how that fits into some of the scriptures that come up. So what is the reward or punishment for sin? The Bible says the wages for sin are everlasting burning in fire. Is that what it says? No, the wages for sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life. See, in the very beginning, God told Eve, if you sin, you will die. And yet the sad thing is, and here it is in Genesis 3, 22, 
lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God said man was not to have eternal life. And the devil said to Eve, you will not surely die. And this lie goes all the way back to the devil that you don't really die. You, you, you sort of die, but you really transmigrate. You instantly go to be with the Lord before the judgment. Or you go to a place of torment. Or you go to limbo or purgatory or Abraham's bosom. And they got all these other scenarios. But the Bible's pretty clear. They're dead and they remain in their graves. Now you know what confuses people is because you read these verses that say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's true. For the Christian, when you're saved, your next conscious thought after you die is the presence of the Lord. A thousand years could go by, but you're not there yet. Uh, King David, Acts chapter 2, Peter says, David is dead and buried and his grave is with us to this day. And then he goes on and says, David has not ascended to heaven. I mean, how much more clear could he be? He's dead, buried, not ascended to heaven. And we all agree David will be saved, right? The Bible's pretty clear on that. So here's a saved person who's dead, buried, not in heaven. And Peter says this after the resurrection by 40 days. Some people say, well, at the resurrection, then all the saints went to heaven. David's still dead, buried, and not in heaven. But for David, when he died about 3,000 years ago, how long will it seem? David slept with his fathers. The next thought he has, it's going to be the moment, the twinkling of an eye, absent from the body. He'll know the resurrection and the presence of God. But it hasn't happened yet because we live in time. We live in the dimension of time. When you're dead, you lose all consciousness of time. Any of you sleep like that at night? I mean, maybe you know somebody who sleeps like that if you don't. Where you, know, you go to sleep and it says 10 o'clock. You wake up and it's 7 o'clock and it feels like two seconds went by. That's pretty nice when that happens, huh? <laughs> what are the only two choices that all people have? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, believes in him, believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what are the two options we have? Perish or everlasting life. The idea that it, the punishment for sin is everlasting torture, well how in the world, uh, if Jesus died for a sin, if he did not suffer forever, how did he pay our penalty? You see what I'm saying? If the penalty for sin is death, did Jesus die? But if the penalty for sin is not perishing or death, if the penalty for sin is everlasting torture, well Jesus was in the grave and he rose after three days and um, Jesus said there's two options so the penalty for sin is not eternal burning number six what will happen to the wicked in hellfire Proverbs I'm sorry Psalms 37 10 and verse 20 for yet a little while and the wicked will not be the wicked shall perish into smoke they will consume away. They'll perish. They will consume away. They will not be. Malachi 4, 1 and 3. The day that comes will burn them up as an oven. All that do wickedly shall be stubble. Leaves them neither root nor branch. The day that comes, will, they, you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. It is so clear. They perish. They're consumed. They're destroyed. They're burnt up. They're burnt with an eternal fire. Because the results of the fire are eternal. You know, God is so merciful. He's trying to make it clear this is the final fire. There's no second chance. Now this is what confuses people. Where will hell fire be? People say, you know, down in hell. I remember one time, I, I always, well, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but when I stand in line and, and I'm at Walmart, where I buy all my finer clothes, and uh, <clears throat> I was actually just bought a nice tie. It sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? Anyway, um, I read the covers of the tabloid magazines. <laughs> I would never buy one unless I do it as a sermon illustration like now. But I, I read the covers and I remember a few years ago I saw one and it said, oil drillers in Siberia drill deep well and reach hell, demons are escaping, or something like that. <laughs> but you know, a lot of people think, way down yonder, hell is down yonder. 
But the Bible's pretty clear that fire rains down on the earth and that becomes hell just like Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read in Revelation 20 verse 9, speaking of the wicked, Gog and Magog, they go up on the breadth of the earth and they surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and the Bible says, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. They're devoured. They're all eaten up. Again, 2 Peter 3.10, it says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the things that are in it will be burned up. Now at this point the dead in Christ have risen. All that's left is the lost. That's why Jeremiah says, I beheld the surface of the earth and it was broken down and all there's no man all the birds of heaven had fled at the coming of the Lord. So there's desolation left behind. So will the devil be in charge of hell? No. You know, how many of you, when you picture the devil, you see something like this. You've got this, this guy, he's, you know, sometimes has bat wings and he's got the horns, of course, and he's got a goatee, which is why I won't grow one anymore. <laughs> Beards are back in, aren't they? It just seems like everybody's, all these pastors have beards and I grew a beard years ago and people told me I look like a sinister minister. <laughs> and so, it's <clears throat> not so bad when it's gray, but when I was younger it was black and I did look kind of devious. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's not good. You're not if you're an evangelist. We already have a bad reputation, don't we? Evangelists, yeah. So, anyway, how to get off that? Oh, the devil's got a beard. And he's got the red leotards, you know, and he's, he's got the tail with a point on it, and he's got the pitchfork. Why? Because he's in charge of hell, and he wants to make sure everyone cooks evenly, and or he's, he's like bales of hay, he's heaving the lost sinners into hell. And this is actually a combination of Greek mythology with Christian myths. Nothing in the Bible says that the devil is in charge of hell. What does the Bible say? Revelation 20.10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Satan is cast into the fire, lake of fire. And the Bible tells us again in Matthew chapter 25 that he declares to the lost, depart from me, he cursed into fire prepared for the devil and his angels. God didn't prepare it for you. He's gone to prepare a mansion for you. If you don't get the mansion, it's be because you didn't want to follow Jesus, but you wanted to follow the devil, so you'll get his reward. Yes. But if you want what Jesus has prepared, then you need to trust and surrender your life to him. So will the fires of hell ever go out? Or does it just burn on through endless eternity? Isaiah 47, 14, There will not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before. It goes out, it's consumed. They're burnt up. Are both the soul and the body destroyed in hell? You can read this in Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And I remember hearing people say before, well yeah, Pastor Doug, you're right that uh, it is true that the, the bodies are burnt up, but the soul is immortal. The soul is burned forever. And we have immortality. You will either be in heaven with the Lord or you're going to be burning forever. And I ask, well, where in the Bible does it say we have immortality? Paul says we are seeking for immortality. Paul says in 1 Timothy, God alone has immortality. And when Jesus comes, the saved will hear him say, this mortal puts on immortality, but we're not gods. We don't have immortality. This is what the devil said to Eve. You cannot surely die. You are gods. You are going to live forever. This is what the Bible says. Eternal life is promised to the redeemed. Death is promised to the lost. Two choices, life or death. Quick story. I was driving back from Lubbock, Texas to Dickens, Texas where I was living about 70 miles across the Texas plains and Christmas Eve, I was with the family, came on this great big, I'm driving a little Mazda GLC and I came across one of these big old, you know, Texas Buicks and there was a family, a father, mother and two daughters and the car broke down. Well, I actually used to do mechanic work, I mean I've gone from the crank all the way up building engines. So I pulled over to see if I could help 
And he said, you know, the lights went out and the alternator or something's wrong. So I looked at it and I said, yep, yeah, let me tow you uh, over to my house. And it was the funniest thing you've ever seen, this little Japanese Mazda <laughs> with my family towing him and his car with his family, his big hook over the rope. And anyway, so we towed him about 20 miles. I had the poor little thing wide open. Oh, and uh, they came and I looked at his car. I said, look, you, your alternator brushes are bad. It's Christmas Eve. We can't do anything until the stores are open. So why don't you stay with us? So he and his family stayed with us. It turns out he was a Baptist pastor. And uh, so, you know, it's a lot easier to witness people when they sort of or owe you, you know. <laughs> That's why I pick up hitchhikers and they say, oh, you're so nice. I say, oh, good. You got to listen to me preach now. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so um, we started talking and he said, well, you're Christian. I'm a Christian. You're a church. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. He says, no, I know a little bit about Adventist. He said, you guys don't believe in hell. I said, no, I, I believe in hell. And it's like I think Pastor John stole my line the other day. I said, my hell's hotter than your hell. I said, your hell just kind of roasts people forever. I said, mine burns them up. <laughs> so we started talking about that subject. We talked about a lot of things. But I remember uh, while we were talking about the subject of hell, and it was a very friendly conversation. Um, I just gave him one scripture after another. And he got real quiet. And he said, you know, Brother Doug, he said, um, I've seen these verses before, and it's really made me wonder. But he said, I'm afraid if I were to tell my people that, they wouldn't come to church anymore. If I were to tell them that the lost is burned up and, and then they're gone, I say, if it wasn't the fear of hell, I, they wouldn't come to church anymore. <laughs> and I said, brother, are you telling me they're coming because they're afraid? I said, that's the wrong reason. They want to come because God is love. Amen. Not because fire insurance of some sort. I mean, who wants to serve a God? The only thing, reason you're serving him is because you don't want to burn in hell. Because if that's the only reason you're serving him, should you ever get to heaven, you've now lost your motivation. <laughs> then you'd be a real threat in heaven because you say, hey, no more hellfire. Ha! <laughs> you'd have a good time here. Right? No, you've got to serve him because you love him. All right. Number 11. For whom will hellfire be kindled? It's, as I mentioned before, it's not for, he doesn't want it for us. Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And I've told you before, the everlasting fire, the eternal fire, is reminding us that the results of this fire are eternal. There is no second chance. How does the Bible refer to God's destruction of the wicked? God is not willing that any should perish. It says in Isaiah 28 verse 21, The Lord shall be wroth that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. It's a strange thing for the Lord. God is a God of love. Jesus is a loving God. He wants to create life. He wants to give life. He wants to save from death. The punishment of the wicked and the destruction of the wicked, uh, it breaks his heart. Yeah, some of you have had to do this before. Uh, we had uh, a couple of dogs. I remember bringing uh, a brother and sister, two dogs, home years ago when our boys were young, the, the older boys. And uh, we named one Duffy. Uh, Duffy, he was a very clumsy dog. <laughs> and Daniel sort of adopted Duffy, and Micah wanted Candy. Candy was a beautiful, you would never believe they were related, but they were brother and sister. Candy was a, a chocolate brown dog with yellow eyes, very sharp, very attentive. Duffy, yeah, I don't know, he, he just went and he bit a rattlesnake or something. He wasn't a very smart dog. <laughs> and uh, he didn't last very long. We never quite found out what happened. Candy was with us 16 years. And she was just a you know, one of those pets that becomes part of your family. Uh, in fact, Candy outlived our son that adopted him. And so finally, when Candy got to that point that dogs typically, you know, people outlive them generally, um, she was in pretty bad shape. And I went, I went back home one time and I saw Candy was just dragging around and looking just miserable. And, and I know in the city you go see the vet. That's not what you do in the country. 
And I realized the time was coming. I told the family, I said, you need to say goodbye to Candy because I got to do something that's going to break my heart, but it's going to be the loving thing to do because she can't get up. She can't walk around. She's laying out there in the mud right now. And it's quite literally what was happening. And so I needed to take her out into the woods and uh, do a strange act. And it made me cry. And I thought, you know, when God punishes the wicked, he loves his lost children. God is love. Infinitely more than we love our kids, let alone our pets. And so if, if it would break my heart like that to have to put down a dog, the idea that God would find any justice or any kind of satisfaction in torturing the lost objects of his creation through endless ages. And you know, there's no justice in that. That would mean if people burned forever and ever, that would mean that Cain, who died about 5,000 years ago, who killed one person that we know of, his brother, has been burning 5,000 years longer than Adolf Hitler and Stalin, who were responsible for millions of deaths. That would mean that the confused teenager that reaches the age of accountability, but they commit suicide. And they die without Jesus. And now it breaks your heart, but sometimes that happens. That they would get the same punishment as Hitler. The, the idea there's justice in that. But the Bible's pretty clear. To whom much is given, much is required. And those who knew their master's will and did not do it, they are beaten with many stripes. And those who did not know and did things worthy of stripes, they are beaten with few stripes. So the Bible's clear. There are varying rewards. Indeed, the spirit of prophecy says there, will, there are some who've been born into and lived such miserable lives in such ignorance that they will just be as though they had not been. God out of mercy for them because they had no light at all. They lived in total pagan darkness. They will be as though they had not been. That's mercy. God is a loving, merciful God. People are going to get what they deserve. Now you need to behave because you know too much. <laughs> Number 13. Does the Bible phrase unquenchable fire indicate that the fire never goes out? It says unquenchable fire. Well, let's look at some examples in the Bible that explain that. Matthew 3 verse 12. He will thoroughly purge the floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And I believe these are the words of John the Baptist. Burn up the chaff. It's like the wheat and the tears. Unquenchable fire. Jeremiah 17, the prophet here warned the people of Israel, if you will not hearken to me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden even entering in the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall be burned with a fire that is not quenched. It says it shall not be quenched. And again he says in Mark 9:47, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. By the way, here is where he uses the word be cast into Gehenna, the city dump. They kept it burning all the time so that it would keep the gases down and they were throwing in old baskets and trash. They were burning it and it had, they threw dead animals in there. There was worms. He talks about the worm doesn't die. It's always a place of, of uh, revolting. But he says, the fire's not quenched. If you're burning garbage, do you call the fireman to put it out or do you let it burn? Why do they call it unquenchable fire? Because you don't want to quench the fire. There's no fireman in hell. Isn't that right? And the, when the wicked are burned, they're going to be burned according to what they deserve. Some is going to be quick, some is going to be longer. The Bible actually says Satan day and night forever and ever. And you're probably wondering what does that mean? So I better get to it. Number 14. Doesn't the phrase everlasting fire mean unending? Jude tells us in verse 7, we read this, Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It means what happens through the fire is forever. There will never again be any wicked. And you can go down to the lowest part of the earth now. It's there in the Jordan Valley where Sodom and Gomorrah were once located. They're not burning today. There's nothing there. 
When Revelation 20.10 says that the wicked will be tormented forever and ever, doesn't that indicate endless time? Read in the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verse 6. Jonah was in the belly of the sea monster, and I bet you that felt like Hades. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I used to think, if Jonah somehow was still alive inside the digestive system of that sea creature, there might have been other things that were on the menu still alive in there. <laughs> It'd be bad enough if you can just imagine being inside uh, some monster, you're all in one piece and then he decides to have an appetizer and, and some dessert and in comes the sea urchin and the stinging jellyfish and bioluminescence flashing and scaring you half to death. And, and you're in there and if, can you imagine three days like that? How long would that, that have seemed to you? Have you ever said to someone, well I haven't seen them forever. And then you might say, and they came over to my house and I thought they were going to stay forever. <laughs> but Jonah says, the earth with her bars was around me forever. But how long was he there? You keep reading, same in chapter 1 it says, three days and three nights. It did have a limit on it. You can also read in Revelation it says, the smoke of their torment ascends up. Revelation 14, 11, forever and ever. What does this mean? Now first of all, where it talks about the smoke, I remember when I used to drive across Texas, I would see the, every 10 miles they had a city. It was a, started out as a big farming state. And uh, all the cities had their own dump. And people would burn the trash in the 55 gallon drums and eventually when it filled up, they'd take it all and they'd dump it, but frequently it was still smoldering. And wherever the dumps were, you could see little riblets of smoke ascending up out of sight forever and ever. And so the smoke, you remember what it said about Sodom and Gomorrah? Abraham looked and he saw it was like the smoke of a furnace. It sends up to heaven. And so when the wicked are all burned, it's going to look like Sodom and Gomorrah. The smoke ascends up forever and ever. So what does this expression forever and ever mean? Now you got to be careful. Because as soon as you try to say, well forever doesn't always mean forever, people are going to say, well aren't we getting life forever? Does that mean our eternal life is not forever? Yeah, we are getting eternal life. You need to read it in its context. But you can't deny there are examples in the Bible where it uses the word forever and it had a definitive end. For example, Exodus 21.6. <clears throat> if you had a servant that you liked and he wanted to stay with you even after he was allowed to go free, you went through this ceremony and it says he would be your servant forever. Well, that didn't mean even on into heaven. It meant until you died. When Hannah brought Samuel to the temple, she brought him to abide there forever. Well, that was, then she goes on, she says in verse 28, and that was 1 Samuel 1.22. Go to 1 Samuel 1.28. That means as long as he lives. That's what it says. So forever meant what? As long as he lives. And the reason the Bible uses a vague term to describe the punishment of the wicked is because it's different for everybody. People are going to get different rewards, right? Are there different rewards even in heaven? That's right. And there are different rewards for the wicked as well. Forever and ever is a biblical expression which means until the end of the age. It doesn't, it's not necessarily an infinite, unending length of time. You need to read that in its context. Now when you run into difficult verses like this, you need to explain them. Someone's going to say to me, well, Pastor Doug, what about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? And it seems like that poor beggar died and the next thing he knows, he's in Abraham's bosom, but the rich man dies who would not share his crumbs he goes to Hades and he's in torment. And he says he's in the flame and send Lazarus with a drop, drop of water to cool me for I'm tormented in this flame. And you can read about that in the Gospel of Luke. It only appears in Luke chapter 16 verse 19. That is a parable. And Jesus uses incredible um, paradoxes in that parable. You've got Lazarus who represents the Gentiles who's outside hungering for the crumbs that fall from the table of the rich man, the Jewish nation that has the bread of life. They're feasting on the word and arguing among themselves and the Gentiles are dying around them, hungering for the crumbs. You remember the Gentile woman came to Jesus. She said, yeah, even the puppies get the crumbs. So it's pretty clear. But what Jesus does is very ironic. It says, the poor beggar who represents the Gentiles, he dies, he goes to Abraham's bosom. Only time that's used in the Bible. Every Jew wanted to be with Father Abraham. 
They want to sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here Jesus has got the Gentile going to Abraham's bosom and the rich man dies and he goes to the Greek place of torment, Hades. They, all the Jews understood Greek mythology. If I were to tell you a story right now and say, alright, one day Alice was walking in Wonderland. You all know right away because you're acquainted with the English fairy tales that I'm not serious, I'm using an illustration, right? Jesus used a term they all understood, it's a parable. So the idea that you die and go right to heaven or hell is not what he was teaching. He was saying, if you don't believe Moses and the prophets, then you won't be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. Because, remember in the story? They said, oh, but if Lazarus would rise from the dead, then my father's house would believe. He said, let them read Moses and the prophets. Jesus, it was a parable for the Jewish nation and for the church that if we're not feeding those who are hungering for the truth that falls from our table, we might find that we're on the outside and the ones who love the truth are on the inside. Has nothing to do with the state of man and death or hellfire in that parable. And someone else is going to be wondering about uh, the thief on the cross and the, we've got some of these. Oh, by the way, uh, there's a website. It's very popular. It's called helltruth.com. It's got all kinds of studies and videos and you can recommend it to anybody, helltruth.com. We get a lot of people that come there and they learn the truth about this and are happy. Number 16, after sin and sinners are destroyed, what will Jesus do for his people? Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes and there will be no more death no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. The Bible says no more pain, no more crying. How can all things be made new and there be a torture chamber full of sinners crying in pain? God is trying to cleanse the universe from pain. He doesn't want an eternal place of pain. He wants all things to be made new. And so the more and more people, even from other churches, are learning the Bible truth about this. This all came down to us from mythology and church tradition to try to scare people. A lot of it was used to manipulate people and to try to get resources from them. I remember years ago when I lived up in the cave that my cat caught a little kangaroo rat. It was right around dinner time. I had a campfire going and and you know cats are kind of sadistic. A dog, if he catches a rat, one gulp it's gone. A cat likes to play with its food. They like the entertainment before dinner. <laughs> and the, you know, they catch it and they let it go. And they, bat it, they jump on it again and then they let it go. And they carry it over and they show you they've got it. And they let it go and they pound. And I, you know, my cat had to eat and so I didn't interfere. But he, got, he brought me this kangaroo rat. And the poor thing was, you know, all beat up and dazed. And my cat let go of it again. And it gave one final hop except it hopped into my campfire. <laughs> listen to you. <laughs> I just talked about a rat falling in the fire. You could not bear the thought of a rat falling in the fire. <laughs> and yet some people think this is what God's going to do. <laughs> Years ago, my mother was very worried because her daughter used to walk two miles to school. This is back when the country was safe and you could send your kids off to school. When the weather was good, she had her kids walk to school and, and uh, she noticed that afternoon that thunderclouds came up and there was a tremendous lightning storm and she figured based on the clock that her daughter was going to be caught right out in the middle of the plains in this very fierce, violent lightning storm. She thought she's going to be scared, she's going to get struck by lightning and she hopped in the jalopy and went down the road to try to pick up her daughter and as she could see over on the hills, her daughter walking on the trail, Whenever there was a, one of these terrifying flashes of lightning, her daughter would stand still, she'd turn up to the sky and she'd smile. And then she'd start walking down the road. She saw two or three times her daughter, lightning would flash. She'd stop, she'd look up where the flash came from and she'd smile. So you keep walking. Finally she got up to her daughter and you know at this point the rain's coming and she said, what in the world were you doing? I saw you every time there's lightning, you turn around and you'd smile. She said, well I figured that God was taking pictures and I wanted to look pretty. <laughs> Now there's a kid that has the right idea of her heavenly father. She was not afraid. God doesn't want us to live in fear. 
And you know, my heart goes out to people. That's why I love this message because when I learned the truth about this, for the first time in my life, I thought, I could be a Christian. I think I could love a God like this. And I was so happy to learn that the Lord Jesus died to save us from the lake of fire because He doesn't want us to perish. He wants us to have eternal life and that He's going to purify the universe and there's going to be no more pain. The wicked are going to be gone. How could you ever enjoy eternity if lost people that you may have known and loved are outside some torture chamber burning through eternity? Would God erase all natural emotion from our hearts? No, God is going to deal with it in a just and a loving way where we will be able to trust and love Him all through eternity. Amen. And don't you want to do that, friends? Amen. God is good. God is love. And we need to get the truth about this out because a lot of people are living lives of fear and they can't trust and love God. And I'd like to just pray with you as we close that we can have that relationship. Amen. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the truth that shows you are a loving God that truth that sets us free. Help us all come to know Jesus in that way. I pray for all those that are listening or watching that they might know that you are a just God of love. There is a reward to be had, eternal life, and the lost will perish. Help us to choose Jesus in life. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.